Hi guys, welcome to The Strong Young Man. The notion that there are vast disparities in power and influence which favour men over women across all levels of society is so prevalent. No doubt there is a very, very tiny subset of the population of hyper-successful men who hold all the levers of power. Issues arise when we use heuristic methods to form the conclusion that the power and influence wielded by this tiny group of men represents the entire structure of Western civilization. Just take a thorough look around and you'll see that this is completely incorrect. Power and influence is spread between the genders more evenly than the dominant cultural influences in the West would have you believe. To challenge the concept of the patriarchy and gender inequality is at best a demonstration of ignorance, at worst an act of misogyny. In actual fact, in the West today, there is not a single privilege or right that men have that women don't have, but the opposite is not true. One of the forms of gender inequality present today is that we freely allow women to express their issues, but we suppress men from expressing theirs. It's the inequality of opportunity to freely speak, the most basic civil right. Sometimes society even crucifies men for expressing concerns about the social inequities that affect them. Men should have the same right to freely speak about the issues they face. This is not to say that female rights don't matter. Unlike feminism, I won't overcompensate. What I want to make clear is that all rights matter, including the rights of men, which have been completely neglected since the turn of the century. The female supremacy movement, known as feminism, has always been and continues to be responsible for ensuring men are pushed to the lower rungs of society in order for females to reign supreme. This toxic movement silences the publicity behind male issues while making sure that female issues are flagged as a priority, even if they are completely fabricated. Feminists actively seek to punish males for what they represent, and often enough they'll celebrate male inequality, believing it to be some sick form of cosmic justice. You must understand that this toxic movement has always been evil. Every aspect of historical and modern feminism has been a hate movement targeted at oppressing men rather than improving the lives of both genders like it purports. For more details on the forgotten evils of historical feminism, read The Suffragette Bombers by Simon Webb. Most feminists will claim they advocate for equal rights for both sexes, but will actively see to it that males are punished for their socio-economic and political success. This attitude is ripping apart the fabric that holds society together. Men and women must improve together at the same rate in order for both genders to remain united. When one gender is lagging behind, both genders are losing. I'd argue that feminism is almost entirely responsible for most of the intergender problems that exist today. Most women, especially feminists, become extremely emotionally reactive any time data indicates that women are not performing as well as men. They react without even looking into the reasons behind the data, which means that they don't even consider the possibility that there could be legitimate or even desirable explanations for this imbalance. It's imperative to consider the story and the reasons behind the data before we go assuming that any inequality of outcome is due to the patriarchy causing inequality of opportunity. I actually addressed this topic in a previous episode where I proved that when you push for equality of outcome, it costs you equality of opportunity and vice versa. Anyway, gear up for today's episode because I have a lot to discuss. I'm going to use a high degree of rationality to logically sort through nine key areas where men and women experience inequality of outcome. Then I'll dissect where the numbers come from and offer my thoughts on whether it's a desirable discrepancy. Number one, the gender pay gap. The gender pay gap is such a pervasive myth in today's society. Yes, if you tally all the income earned by all men and compare it to all the income earned by all women, you will find that men earn more when averaged out. Currently in Australia, the difference between male and female earnings is a flat 13%. This doesn't necessarily mean that men are paid more for the same work. Thinking about this logically, if businesses had to pay men more than women for the same work output, then why would businesses even have men on their payroll when they can pay women 87% of what they would have to pay a male employee? The gender pay gap is calculated by tallying the total average earnings of men and comparing it to the total average earnings of women. This figure does not take into account the hours worked gap between men and women. Men work approximately six more hours per week, a stat that largely contributes to this difference. The hours worked gap is because women take more time off to care for children, something that they choose to do. Women have more of an inclination to work part-time and value relational gratification over professional achievement, which I think is a good thing. High levels of testosterone in men mean that men have more drive and ambition, and so they work longer hours. High testosterone also means that men take more dangerous jobs that are fiscally rewarded for the risk. Because of this inclination, Australian men are victims of over 96% of all workplace fatalities. Similar numbers are found across all Western nations across the globe. This study is almost never mentioned by feminists. Is it desirable to equalise this statistic too? How the hell do we go about this? Finally, a man's appreciation in society is almost entirely based off his ability to provide more than he consumes. 
He must provide financial security to his family and to society in order to obtain respect and love from others. A man who cannot provide this support is not considered a real man. There is no such phrase as not a real woman for a woman who doesn't carry this burden. A woman can be loved for staying at home with the children, but if a man doesn't provide value, he's ostracised to the streets. The data confirms this too. Over 66% of people living on Australian streets are men. Because men need to meet this financial requirement in order to be appreciated, men are more likely to choose higher paying jobs that have scalable incomes. Men pick these jobs because they have to, not because they enjoy them. If we equalise the salary for all jobs per hours worked, men would choose the easy jobs and it would completely fuck up the way society functions. Unfortunately, many people attribute the gender pay gap as an outcome of male dominance and not a symbol of male subservience. When accounting for all these things, the gender pay gap diminishes to a mere 1-2% to here in Australia. That's actually 1-2% to in favour of women. America and other Western nations all have similar statistics. For more details on this, check out Dr. Warren Farrell's research, which spans over a decade. So is the gender pay gap a desirable discrepancy? It most certainly is. We should always pay people what they're worth. An employee that works harder for their company is inherently more valuable and should be rewarded accordingly. This is the basis of the free market economy, which creates the richest societies. Research has also shown that the more a woman earns, the less happy she becomes. I think this is because the more women earn, the less they focus on family, which is the largest source of their happiness. I don't think this is desirable for women. I don't want them to be unhappy. Rather than ordering women to perform hard work to close this gap, society should encourage women to strike the balance of full-time work that aligns with their social preferences. Any discrepancy in total earnings emanating from this should be evaluated, and if found to be legitimate, should be accepted as personal choice rather than gender oppression or male privilege. Number 2. The Patriarchy while it is true that most people in positions of power are men, this does not mean that most men are in positions of power. At the very top of society are a group of hyper-successful, diligent, elite individuals that occupy all the positions of power and influence. The majority of these positions are held by men. The characteristics required to get to the top position of any dominance hierarchy, such as aggression and endeavour, are expressed more in individuals with high levels of androgen hormones, which are responsible for transcribing these effects. What feminists and modern social conventions would have you believe is that all the men are at the top of the dominance hierarchy and that all the women are at the bottom of the dominance hierarchy, when in actual fact, this is not the complete picture. Don't be so ignorant to believe the current understanding that this power and influence wielded by this tiny minority of hyper-successful men represent the entire structure of Western civilization. Understand this, it's not who's in the position of power and influence that matters, but it's who influences the beliefs of the people in the positions of power and influence. Women actually influence the beliefs, and hence the choices of the individuals in positions of power. Women have a complete monopoly over the development of men these days. Kicking fathers out of the home, they gain exclusive access to shape the minds of young men into their perception of the ideal man to serve the feminine imperative. Most major civil institutions, including childcare, education and media, are dominated by women and they have firmly embedded gynocentric dominance. To quote my big fat Greek wedding, the man is the head of the household, but the woman is the neck, and she can turn the head any way she wants. It's such a mind blow to consider that all this time, women have been giving off the impression that we are living in an oppressive patriarchy while dominating the industries that shape the minds of future patriarchs. Number three, victims of violence. Males are subject to violent crimes at higher rates than females. In Australia, in 2021 to 2022, 2.9% of women aged over 18 experienced physical violence in the previous 12 months compared with 6.1% of men of the same demographic. Walking on the street at night, you are more likely to be assaulted if you're a male. Yes, males commit most of the violent crimes, but the majority of men are not violent. A small minority of men are violent, and these men are responsible for the majority of the violent crimes against men and women. Unfortunately, because most of the victimizers are men, most women see all men as potential victimizers and this makes it hard to see them as capable of becoming a victim of violent crime. This is known as the self-categorization theory, in which people have a tendency to perceive collections of people, including themselves, as part of a group. Once the social group is determined, the social categorizations of others unconsciously shape our perceptions of people within that group. This theory isn't always bad. It's useful to stereotype people because it fast-tracks the processing of information present in your environment. For example, it's safe to assume that a person who always dresses in suits has a large amount of disposable income. Of course, this won't always be correct, but if you're stereotyping based on statistical normalities, it will be accurate a large majority of the time. The problem with stereotyping comes when we categorise people based on statistical outliers. 
Now, as I said, a very, very small minority of men are violent, and these men are responsible for the majority of violent crimes against men and women. Ultimately, it doesn't matter what gender commits the violent crime. The victim is still the victim. It's not appropriate to discount male victims of violence because of biases around a person's social identity. A lot of people actually think women are subject to more violent crimes than men. The reason that so many people think this is because violence against women receives more publicity. It's reported more publicly because it's more of a tragedy when a woman is harmed than when a man is harmed, unless that man brings significant value to society. Females have always been the preserved sex, and males have always been the disposable sex. The average woman has always had more value than the average man because they make the greater reproductive sacrifice. Is it fair that men are considered disposable? No, not really. But that doesn't mean that we need to claim victimhood and demand that it needs to change. Reality is not fair, and it doesn't have to be. I think all violence towards people should be marginalised as much as possible. The statistics of violence against men compared to violence against women doesn't mean that women oppress men. It should only serve to emphasise the area in which we need to concentrate our efforts in marginalising violent crime. Biases around men's brutality and expendability mean that violence against men is viewed as much less serious than violence against women, and I think this concept needs to change. Number 4. Men die in wars 103,000 Australians have died in wars. Almost all of them were men. I don't think we ought to strive for equality in this stat. There is a reason men go to war, to protect women and children. If women fought in combat, it would make the entire sacrifice redundant. The loss of men has to be risked to protect the group. Again, women are the preserved sex for the value that they bring to society through their ability to have children. Eggs are expensive and sperm is cheap, and one man's sperm is enough to impregnate an entire village of women. Because women made the greater reproductive sacrifice, men were required to make their own sacrifice, defending the tribe's perimeter from external threats. The pregnant woman is immobile and needs protecting. This is the most primitive form of cooperation between men and women, and it's a beautiful thing. The men that were strong survived the battles and were rewarded with sexual access to women. Part of the reason for the evolved strength differences between men and women is because it was necessitous. Over 2.4 million years, men became stronger as nature selected for men who could fight off external threats. Because women are weaker than men, they can't compete in physical combat on the same level as a man. Today we are very selective with who we allow to fight in combat. One of the physical barriers to entry into the Australian Army is 8 push-ups for women and 15 push-ups for men. In order to progress to Australian Army Special Forces as a man or a woman, you must be able to do 40 push-ups. There is no discernment between a man and a woman at this level and for a good reason. Whether you're a man or a woman, what should discriminate you from being a Special Forces agent is your ability to perform. If you're in battle, strength is the best protector of the group. To allow women to fight in wars compromises the safety of the entire group and potentially the country. Additionally, women lack other traits crucial for military battle. On average, men are bigger than women by height and weight. Men have thicker bone mineral density and more muscle mass per kilo of body weight. Men are stronger than women, even when controlled for weight. Men have a better sense of direction. Men have better hand-to-eye coordination. Men are better at tracking fast-moving objects and resolving detail at a distance. Men handle sleep deprivation better. Men act quicker and more effectively under stress. Men are better at handling psychological trauma. Men have brains that are better at pattern recognition, logical analysis, planning, and military strategy. War plays to a man's genetic strengths, and so if we want the strongest people defending our country, we need to select from the best men, and so this stat should not be equalised. In war times, women have the option to fight, whereas males are obliged to fight. Despite everyone pushing for equality during peacetime, I think when wartime comes, most women will not be putting their hands up for the draft, whereas most men will see it as an honour to protect their country. Our male ancestors recognised that men are less valuable than women and children, and they accepted the responsibility of protecting women and children for the benefit of the tribe. Men are okay bearing the burden of this responsibility. Strong men consider it an honour. Men are hardwired to preside, provide, and protect women and children. Smart men understand that men and women are better as complementary opposites rather than adversarial competitors. It's the gender differences, not the androgynous similarities, that make us work best together. Instead of pushing for equality of war deaths between the genders, I want to see a greater appreciation from women in regards to the sacrifices men make for them and our children, not just in war, but every day. Women, after all, are the greatest beneficiaries of the masculine sacrifice. Most men sacrifice their family time to provide a comfortable life for their woman and children. Some men go so far as sacrificing their physical health just to earn an income to support their family. At the extreme are the men who sacrifice their lives to defend their country. Number 5. Rape In some places, such as the United States, males are raped at higher rates than females when you include prison. This number is significant because over 92% of prisoners in the US are men. 
The US does imprison its citizens more than any other society across the globe, currently and historically. In all other Western nations, women report higher levels of sexual violence, but the numbers are not as skewed as most people are led to believe. Accurate data on this is incredibly hard to find because the definition of rape varies and women are more likely to report their experience of sexual violence. Most of the studies ascertain their statistics from police reports, which are overwhelmingly filed by women. In Australia, the data indicates that 83% of victims of sexual assault were female, though this number is likely inflated due to the underreporting of this crime by men relative to women. Similar to violence, the rape of females is more publicised in the media, and there are still people out there that believe that only women can be victims of rape. While the rape of a man is bad, it doesn't cause the same consequences, literal and psychological, as it does for women. The rape of a woman is actually far worse than the rape of a man. Rape for women is an evolved psychological fear that is incredibly hard for men to fully comprehend. I think society might understand this on a level below consciousness, and that's why it's viewed more seriously. The reason that raping a woman is so much worse is because it's forcibly taking their sexual selection away from them. There are larger potential complications that stem from the rape of a woman that do not occur when a man is raped. Women are the sexual selectors because they offer the greater reproductive sacrifice. Known as the parental investment theory coined by Robert Trivers in 1972, the sex that invests more in its offspring will be more selective when choosing a mate and the less investing sex will have intrasexual competition for access to mates. This goes for most of the animals in the animal kingdom, not just humans. Raping a woman robs her of this ability. It's a terrible thing to force a woman to copulate against her will. It's slightly different for men. For men, the rape only causes the trauma that the physical affliction causes them, similar to the trauma experienced by violent crime. It doesn't cause men the same level of psychological trauma because they're not having their sexual strategy forcibly taken from them. The male sexual strategy is to reproduce in numbers that ensure that his bloodline survives. With the male sexual strategy suppressed in modern times, this means that men must concentrate on ensuring the survival of the sperms that make it. This takes the form of parental investment in his children. The equivalent psychological rape of a man by a woman is when a woman tricks a man into fathering a child that is not genetically his offspring. This is most men's greatest fear, to unwittingly invest in offspring that he mistakenly believes to be his own, known as cuckoldry. This is the psychological equivalent of how men are raped today, to which most women don't understand. Another extension of this rape is how men are kicked out of the family home but forced to financially invest in their children. They are forced to provide for a family that doesn't appreciate them. They have all the responsibility but none of the rights and privileges that come along with this responsibility. While the rape of a woman is a terrible crime, I think the worst issue around rape is the lack of due process men are granted when faced with an allegation. Women have been indoctrinated to falsely believe that we live in a culture that enables and encourages rape on a systemic level. In modern times, all a woman has to do is claim that she's raped and a man is judged as guilty, even if he can subsequently prove his innocence. Most of the time, the name of the accuser is protected, whereas the accused receives a hanging by public opinion, regardless of whether guilty or innocent. Most of the time, this has a permanent lasting effect to his career, his personal relationships and his reputation. Movements such as Believe All Women are terribly counterintuitive to due process. False rape charges are actually far more prevalent than most people believe. A review of 556 rape allegations filed against Air Force personnel found that 27% of women later recanted. Then, 25 criteria were developed based on the profile of those women and then submitted to three independent reviewers to review the remaining cases. If all three reviewers deemed the allegation was false, it was categorised as false. As a result, 60% of all allegations were found to be false. Of those women who later recanted, many didn't admit the allegation was false until just before taking a polygraph test. Others admitted it was false only after having failed a polygraph test. Crunching the numbers, we find that 71% of the allegations in this review were false. This is very concerning. Women who make false rape allegations are diluting the seriousness of the crime for those who are raped, not to mention the permanent destruction they are causing to the lives of the falsely accused. A false rape allegation will always cause permanent destruction to the individuals for the rest of their lives, because no matter how much it is proven to be false, the seed of doubt has been planted forever. In India, this is a systemic issue. Indian women commonly lodge false rape allegations in order to extort men for money. For further details on this, check out the documentary India's Sons, Tale of False Rape Case Survivors. As a summary, the people of India believe a woman's word without proof, and women are abusing this presumption of guilt in the following ways. If a woman is caught in an affair, she alleges rape. If a woman wants a man's resources, she alleges rape. If a woman wants revenge, she alleges rape. If a woman changes her mind about having sex after the fact for any reason, she alleges rape. It's very concerning if we operate under the assumption that people are guilty until proven innocent. This sets an extremely dangerous precedent for other, more serious crimes like murder and treason, especially in jurisdictions with the death penalty. 
If we're going to inflict a serious punishment to rapists, then we need to treat the investigation with a proportional level of seriousness. We can't just believe all women at their word and then hastily enforce the punishment without due process of law. We also can't afford to have society take rape less seriously because women are having a boy who cried wolf moment of boredom. This hurts the real victims who have suffered enough. With more and more people lodging false rape allegations, we are finding it increasingly difficult to determine who the real victims are, which makes it increasingly difficult to offer them the support they require. Number six, men receive harsher prison sentences. This is another example of female privilege and inequitable civil rights between men and women on a systemic level. This observation is a pattern common amongst all developed nations across the globe. This graph shows the breakdown of the people sentenced in the county and supreme courts each year in Victoria, Australia, which is where I'm from. These higher courts only hear cases with more serious offences. When these cases are heard, men are far more likely than women to be sentenced to a term of imprisonment, 47.8% of men compared with 30% of women, while women are more likely to be given a wholly suspended sentence, 33.6% of women compared with 22% of men. This discrepancy is undesirable and both men and women should be viewed as equals in the eyes of the law. Number 7. Male Mental Health This one is honestly probably the most concerning. Male suicides make up three quarters of all suicides across all age ranges. The highest risk time for both men and women is middle age. A woman's strength comes from her ability to appear weak and helpless and a man's weakness is that he is viewed as being strong and is therefore above helping. I find it strange that this one is not as publicised nearly as much as it should be. If the numbers were flipped, it would be an absolute atrocity for these feminists. In a perfect world, no life should ever be lost to suicide, and these numbers imply that we should be investing more effort into supporting men and the struggles that they face. Number 8. No reproductive rights Men have absolutely no reproductive rights to their children. Women have the right to children, and men have to fight for children. Once a woman becomes pregnant, she has a monopoly over everything for that fetus. A woman can support, abort, or extort. This is your reproductive rights as a man. Basically, the only time a man gets what he wants is when it aligns identically with what a woman wants. Personally, I think abortion should be illegal. It is, after all, not in the best interests of the child, which should always be the number one priority. To the child, the parents should come second. Once you remove abortion, most of the problems associated with reproductive rights become menial. If both mother and father want to keep the baby, they should. If one of them wants to keep the baby, they should, without obligation for one parent to provide support to the other. That's what the government is for. If both parents don't want the baby, then offering it up for adoption is the most logical decision. Number nine, women live longer. The average life expectancy for an Australian male at birth is 81.3 years, and for a female, 85.4 years. Not one single country across the globe has male life expectancy greater than female life expectancy. Historically, this has always been the case too. Women have always lived longer than men. Male infant mortality, excluding abortion and infanticide, is higher across every human race in every period of history. A major contributing factor to this is that male fetuses have higher levels of testosterone, which is immunosuppressive. This means that they are more likely to acquire an infection. As men mature through puberty and adulthood, the immunosuppressive effects of testosterone only get worse as blood serum concentrations increase. This is in contrast to the female hormone, estrogen, which provides women with a biological layer of protection that men don't naturally possess to the same degree. This reduces the death rate among middle-aged women, increasing their life expectancy. Another reason the mortality rate is much higher for men is that men take more dangerous jobs with a much higher risk of death. They are also likely to take jobs in environments with substances that cause health issues such as coal, oil, gasoline, plaster, plastics and fiberglass. Men are also far more likely to undertake the more stressful forms of work, which causes more of a breakdown to their immune system. Men are also far more likely to be victims of suicide or homicide. Men also take higher risks in their everyday life, which results in them making stupid choices that permanently cause their death. I'd like to see the murder and suicide rates decrease for both genders, but other than that, there isn't a lot we can do to correct this one. It's all in the genetics. In the last 70 years, the world average life expectancy of both sexes has improved, up from 46.5 in 1950 to 71 in 2021. Unfortunately, we can't fight nature, and we should just accept that for all of human history, women have and will continue to outlive men. This is okay. Some differences aren't supposed to be equalised. If you really want to make the best circumstances for yourself, spend your life living healthy, and you'll outlive a lot of women anyway. One woman who drastically fell short of her life expectancy was American writer Nora Vincent. I'm going to run through her story because it's a tragedy of epic proportions that illustrates perfectly just how little women understand how hard life is for men. Nora Vincent was a radical feminist who believed that men had life much easier than women. 
At the turn of the century, she set out to prove her theory by conducting what she described as a human project about learning. She created an alter ego, Ned Vincent, who would live as a man to gain a greater understanding of the true masculine experience. In order to effectively pose as a man, she acquired a buzz cut and flattened her chest using a small sports bra. She also hired a makeup artist to fake a five o'clock shadow and trained for months to imitate a deeper male voice. She changed her diet and exercise regime to bulk up with more upper body muscle. She participated in masculine activities with other men like joining an all-male bowling club, joining a men's therapy group and even went to a strip club. Nora, a lesbian, also went on dates with about 30 women as Ned in an attempt to understand what it's like to date women as a man. After 18 months of this deception, she started to unravel psychologically. She was starting to hate women due to how badly they were treating her when they thought she was a man. She could not believe how bad men had things. This was in complete contradiction to her long-standing feminist mental schema around male privilege and the patriarchy. She was faced with an overwhelming amount of evidence that indicated that she needed to modify this feminist mental schema and the psychological stress was taking its toll. Persisting with the experiment a little longer, she continued her emotional descent and she eventually checked herself into a mental institution. The mental strain of maintaining a false identity during the making of Self-Made Man, in addition to the rapid updating of her entire mental framework, ultimately caused a depressive breakdown, leading Vincent to admit herself into a locked psychiatric facility. On July 6, 2022, aged 53, she died via assisted suicide at a clinic in Switzerland. In a statement that Nora made after the experiment, but before her suicide, Nora said she fully realised and appreciated the benefits of being female and the disadvantages of being male. Vincent also stated that she'd gained more sympathy and understanding for men and the male condition, and this is my hope for my female viewers, because male privilege is a total fucking myth. As you can see, there are many inequalities of outcome between the genders. Some differences make sense and should be left alone, and others need more attention. Unfortunately for men, with the exception of rape, we bear the burden of all the undesirable inequalities outlined in today's episode. We need more publicity around these issues if we want things to change. Women have evolved to prioritise their own needs and the needs of their offspring's survival, and this means that they're unable to empathise with men unless that man is their offspring. It's men, and men only, who are responsible for fixing the de-evolution that feminism has caused to Western civilization. We need to take responsibility for our compliant role in allowing these bullshit regressive ideologies to pollute society. This will improve the lives of both men and women. To fix this, we need to provide equal civil rights for everyone, including the freedom for men to voice the inequalities that afflict our gender, as well as equality under the law. The next step is to provide everyone, man or woman, with the equal opportunity to shine according to their genetic potential. Any variance in the data that emanates from this ideal cannot be put down to one sex oppressing the other. Rather, it's due to varying environmental and genetic factors, as well as the choices that people make. When only one sex is winning, both sexes lose. We can only move forward at the same rate that the lagging gender is moving forward, in order to remain united as a group. If any part of that group falls too far behind, then the entire group suffers. Thanks for watching today's episode. In episode 119, I'll be talking about how to process criticism. Subscribe and click the bell icon to be notified when it drops. Catch you then.